The Kiseki series, which is translated as the Trail series in English, heavily builds on shared plot lines and complex political intrigue across many games. So, welcome to the next installment in this series of detailed but still condensed summaries. There's a lot to cover in the second game of the Crossbell arc, so let's dive right into Ao no Kiseki, which is most likely translated as Trails to Azure. Ao no Kisaki begins on the western border of the Calvert Republic. Arios, Dudley, Lloyd, and Noel have been granted permission by the Republican military to enter the remains of the DG Colt's Altair Lodge, the exact one that Tio was saved from all those years ago. As soon as the military officer leaves, dangerous monsters attack the party. This investigation first materialized after Crossbell leadership received a message from the Imperial government regarding Ernest Royce and the former chairman Hartman after the two were denied asylum in Erebonia. The wanted men ended up in Altair City in Calvert somehow, so a secret agreement between Crossbell's mayor and the Republican government has ordered the arrest of the two. The mission was then entrusted to the Special Support Section, who called on allies from the Bracer Guild, Section 1 of the CSPD, and the CGF for assistance. The investigation has led them to the remains of the Altair Lodge, where Ernest and Hartman are currently in hiding. Arios recalls his mission six years ago once they stepped foot into the structure. Finding Teal was the one ray of hope they found after witnessing all the atrocities that occurred here. Apparently, there's a large altar here that is similar to that found in the Fort of the Sun. This is particularly troubling knowing that Ernest is in possession of a large amount of the Red Gnosis that causes demonic transformations. There's no telling what he's planning in coming here. Lloyd, as the leader of this mission, repeats their main objective, then commands everyone to proceed. Along the way, they encounter various creepy monsters similar to the final creatures of Zero no Kisaki. They also come across various rooms that still contain the instruments used to conduct experiments on the children. A large pack of dinosaur-looking monsters appear and are swiftly defeated with the help of Arios and Dudley. Dudley wonders if the monsters that Guy and Arios encountered were small fries like the ones they just fought, but Arios recalls how the creatures were much more powerful six years ago. His team also had to deal with the mad cultists at the time as well. The sheer prowess of the older men is intimidating to say the least, but serves as motivation for Lloyd and Noel. Ernest and Hartman are up ahead. The latter is pleading to be let go. He's tired of all of this. Ernest's response is that he needs Hartman to make a comeback in Crossbell's politics so that he can make Ernest the mayor. Hartman sees no feasible way they could ever return to the world of politics, especially with Dieter Croy as the new mayor. But Ernest says it'll be easy to manipulate the future once he becomes a true god, just like Master Joachim. The investigation team finally catches up as Ernest turns to greet them. Gnosis has made him privy to all the actions they take in order to find the two of them. Hartman says he'll willingly turn himself in as long as they just arrest this lunatic. Lloyd presents his CSPD badge and lists the crimes the former secretary is charged with, but the man is set on succeeding Joachim. He summons Middle Age archaisms that are even stronger than the ones fought in Zero. Ernest leaves the archaisms to the party while he drags a screaming Hartman further into the cult lodge. The Archaisms pose no real threat to Arios and Dudley, so they immediately take off after the fugitives once the monsters are defeated. Dudley notices that the tuckered out Lloyd and Noel aren't following behind, so he turns back and asks if they are alright. Thanks to Arios' warning, the detective is able to jump out of harm's way right as large stones take out the path. Lloyd and Noel apologize for their lack of ability, but Arios tells them to just take the lower path that eventually leads to the same place. The two men wish them safety, then take off. 
A bit further in, the two are starting to realize how much tougher the mobs are with only the two of them, but Lloyd is grateful that he has such reliable backup from Noelle, who responds that it's all thanks to Sonya's tough training regimen. It's too bad that Ellie, Tio, and Randy are away from the SSS duties though, since they've been training and handling important tasks that are related to their individual specialties. Further ahead lies the altar where Ernest and Hartman are currently arguing. The latter screams at the former secretary to stop involving him in the cult's delusions, but Ernest responds that he's in no position to talk since the former chairman was a regular patron at the Paradise Lodge. Lloyd and Noel finally confront them and demand info on what happened to Arios and Dudley. Apparently, Ernest left a present of 10 middle-aged archaisms to keep them busy. Ernest activates the abilities of Gnosis and reads Lloyd's memories, piecing together what the other SSS members and new politicians of Crossbell have been up to for the past month. He plans to disband the SSS once he becomes mayor, then plans to bring Ellie back to his side. Lloyd and Noel soon find themselves up against his demonized form, where their attacks hardly scratch him. A frightened Hartman runs off but is struck by a powerful ball of energy fired by Ernest. Because of the large septium veins in this area, apparently Ernest will be able to unlock the door to D. Just as Joachim said, he plunges his sword into the ground and undergoes a horrific transformation similar to Joachim's final form. However, unlike the priest's ability to see the answers to everything, Ernest is unable to reach this level of enlightenment. In the former secretary's moment of panicked confusion, Lloyd tempts the idea that Joachim may have been lying to him. But this just pisses the former secretary off. A large sword nearly skewers Lloyd. With this new weapon, Ernest prepares to crush the two, but Arios and Dudley make it just in time. As a team of four, they do enough damage that the demonic creature's body turns entirely red. He tries to summon the same binding attack that Joachim used on the party back in Zero, but Lloyd's experience allows everyone to dodge just in time. Then, Ernest's flesh begins to melt, just like Joachim's. He screams that he doesn't want to die, so Lloyd rushes forward, trying to bring Ernest back to his real human form. The former secretary is shocked that Lloyd would go so far to try and help him after everything he's done, but the detective just screams at him that Mayor McDowell and Ellie would be saddened if he were to die here. Ernest begins apologizing for his inability, as it looks like it's too late to save him. But a priest's voice cuts in, saying a blessing over the creature. It turns out to be our favorite wandering priest, Kevin. His powerful church technique, in combination with his stigma, is enough to save Ernest and return him to his human form. Of course, most people are not privy to this kind of information regarding the church. Lloyd, Noel, and especially Dudley are confused as to how a regular priest made it to this location and what exactly just happened. It seems like Kevin and Arios go back a bit since the Bracer specifically requested the priest to help with this case. Dudley reads through the lines and assumes that Kevin is part of the Congregation of Sacraments, aka the Grawls Ritter. Once they return to Altair City, Dudley and Arios are entrusted with transporting the criminals back to prison. Unfortunately, Kevin couldn't contact them ahead of time because of Archbishop Eralda. It's just as Ren and the Meister discussed last game, the Archbishops made it so that the Gralsritter can't step foot in Crossbell. Arios thanks Lloyd and Noel for a true job well done this time. Dudley backs up Arios' words, though he does it in his typical tsundere way. He officially graduates Lloyd from his Section 1 training, then the two mentor figures drive off. Lloyd and Noel wonder what Kevin's plans are now, since the detective would like to invite him back to Crossbell to give him a proper thanks. The priest would like to ask them more about what they know about the DG cult, but he has to meet with someone soon. 
Kevin was part of a church operation four years ago, though, that dealt with the remnants of the cult. If he can state his case, the lodge they dealt with was probably the worst of the lot. Arios really helped the Grawls Ritter out with that one, so Kevin's just returning the favor here. The priest does thank Lloyd for his role today as well, since the detective's words brought Ernest back to the right state of mind so that Kevin's techniques could successfully take care of the rest. Noelle and Lloyd then head back to Crossbell. Reese appears just moments later with a box of roasted chestnuts. Kevin asks her if she'll really be fine on her own, but she says he absolutely can't come along with her since he'd be burned at the stake by the Archbishop. Remember Owen of the Congregation of Divine Worship? One of the first guys that Kevin had to take out? One of the reasons that Archbishop Eralda is so against the Congregation of Sacraments is due to this case, apparently. Because of this, Reese is going undercover on her own. Kevin truly wishes for her safety, since it looks like a certain group of people have begun moving in Crossbell. Then he finishes with the ominous statement that Crossbell, the demon city, may truly live up to its name. On the train back to Crossbell City, Noelle asks that Lloyd drop her sergeant major title. She prefers just Noelle during her time with the special support section. In exchange, Lloyd hopes that Noelle will speak more openly with them without the usual formalities she tends to use. He learns that her father passed away 10 years ago in an incident while serving at his post in the CGF. Noelle and Fran join the CGF and CSPD respectively in order to protect Crossbell, just like their father aimed to do. This prompts Lloyd's own internal reflection regarding the similarity in following his brother's example. The conversation becomes even more serious as they discuss the aftermath of Rivace's demise. The mob brought a certain amount of order and stability to the entire underworld. But since they've been completely removed, and so suddenly at that, there's now a major power imbalance within the city. Furthermore, it looks like Erebonia and Calvard will soon impose increasing political pressure on Crossbell after the loss of their influential, imperial, and republican faction congressmen following their arrests. Since the future seems so uncertain, Tio, Randy, and Ellie went on to train their specialties, while the SSS as a whole received reinforcements. One being Noelle, of course, and the other being Wazi. Apparently, he was the one who actually approached the SSS in the first place, since he had a recommendation from the new mayor for helping during the crisis at the IBC, they couldn't really turn him down. Even though his personal history is unknown, he does have a lot of helpful connections and knowledge regarding the underworld. And despite the teasing he'll surely be inflicting on all his new SSS companions, he is someone they can trust. The train finally pulls into Crossbell City in the backdrop of the setting sun. Lloyd and Noelle are treated to a nice surprise in the form of all their loved ones coming to greet them. Kia and Fran give Lloyd and Noelle warm welcome back hugs. Then Ellie unexpectedly appears not too far behind, since she has just completed all her studies under her grandfather's tutelage. She and Lloyd share a certain moment that everyone just has to softly comment on. Noelle salutes Chief Sergei, but the latter reminds her that at the SSS there's no need for military formality or hierarchy. Wazi is the last to show up. Thanks to his intel, Lloyd and Noelle were able to get in touch with a helpful informant in Altair City. Wazi gets up close and personal with Lloyd, laying on the skills that make him a popular host. Noelle is rather shocked, Ellie is obviously annoyed, but Kia is on point with her reaction. The chief finally gets down to business and announces the official restarting of the special support section at 18.30. Thus concludes the prologue of Ao no Kisaki. Two days after Ernest's arrest, Ellie is seen operating the terminal in Tio's absence. One of the urgent requests calls for an investigation into Lecter Arundel, who is suspected to be an Imperial Intelligence Officer. 
Apparently, he's Chancellor Osborne's right-hand man. There's a lot to investigate and get done in general before the West Zemuria trade conference next month, which was proposed and is sponsored by Mayor Croy. Chief Sergei then arrives, prompting Noel to immediately stand at attention out of force of habit. The SSS daily life is clearly shaken up a bit by our lovely new additions. Entirely out of the blue, the chief gives them an order to stop by the police academy after they're done with the requests for the day. Before they head off, they stop by Kia's room to remind her that she has Sunday school today. The young girl is currently doing her math homework like a good student. Noelle recalls how she almost never did her work, while Wazi goes a step further, since he almost never showed up to the actual lessons. Both Lloyd and Ellie turn to him, telling him not to set a bad example, but Kia is entirely unfazed. Wazi seems to notice the difficulty of Kia's homework, but doesn't voice his suspicions. The five then head out of the building together. They attempt to go out of the back entrance, but it's blocked off by construction. Chief Sergei had the workers start on this job while everyone else was still away, so no one knows what it's for. They meet up with Ryu and Henry in Central Square. The two boys are happy to see that the special support section is starting up again, since they're almost as good as the Bracers now. Lloyd and Ellie introduce their new recruits. Since Kia can head to school with the boys, the four let the kids take off on their own. In order to get the citizens acquainted with the new SSS members, they begin a general round of the city. First off is a stop by the Bracer Guild. It's heartwarming to see how much Michelle and the Bracers now value the work the police do. A stop by Wazi's bar shows that the former Testament's gang members are now running the place as a full-fledged establishment. They leave the bar without a hitch, but the same can't be said about the Saber Vipers hangout. Wald has been in a terrible mood lately because the Testaments no longer stir up any trouble, and Wazi himself just had to go and become a dog of the police. Since then, Wald has hardly stepped foot in Ignis. Dino blames Wazi for all the tension among the Saber Vipers, but the former delinquent won't allow himself to be badmouthed. He's just living his own life. They shouldn't unfairly judge him for what's going on with their own gang. Though he says all of this, Wazi does look rather distressed as they leave. At Backstreet, they learn from a real estate manager that the entirety of Revache's old building is currently for sale. They visit a couple other friends and allies before finally heading to the CSPD building. Unsurprisingly, Fran can't help herself from giving her big sis a big welcome. Detective Emma from Section 1 gives them the details of the Lecter investigation. As of now, they're having trouble confirming that he's even in Crossbell, since he's able to escape their notice every time they come close to tracking him down. They'd like the four to confirm both his location and identity. The SSS is entrusted with this case since they have dealt with Lecter in the past. Though, Detective Dudley would have been given the job if he weren't currently at a meeting in Liberal that deals with the upcoming trade conference. Since Lecter has been reportedly hanging out in Backstreet, the four begin their investigation there. Reporter Grace is already scoping out the old Rivace building when the four arrive. They exchange quick greetings, then Grace tries to discreetly return to her work. Unfortunately, it's a little too late since Cow and his right-hand man have already finished their survey of the site. It's quite a waste for such a large warehouse to go unutilized, so the Heiwei branch manager is only thinking of its most efficient use. It looks like the mob will secure a good deal soon, so they're in a good mood. Cow even allows reporter Grace to write an article of the Heiwei's brazen plan. The situation begins to look troubling. If the Heiyue are able to acquire the property, they'll be able to monopolize the entirety of Crossbell's underworld. But right now, they must focus on the Lecter investigation. Fortunately for them, Miss Grace had just seen him at the Old Dragon Inn just a short while ago. She hurries off to question Cow, so the four proceed to the restaurant. 
Somehow, the redhead is getting along swimmingly with the chef. He even gets helpful pointers in making the best version of Mabodofu. The four approach and receive a big welcome from Lecter. He turns to the chef and tells him that these are his hard-working best friends he was just talking about. The chef appreciates the help, and in the four's confusion, Lecter uses the opportunity to jump over the counter and escape. Despite it all being a misunderstanding, the chef is generous enough to give them ingredients and a recipe for his fried rice. With no time to waste, they rush out of the inn only to find Lecter long gone. They begin asking around if anyone has spotted the redhead. Some bystanders eventually point them towards the department store. On the rooftop, Lecter is gazing at the nearly completed Orcus Tower, which will serve as Crossbell's new seat of government. It's also the entire continent's first high-rise building, towering at 40 stories tall. The completed tower will be officially unveiled at the trade conference next month. Lloyd requests Lecter's cooperation with their investigation, and it looks like the redhead will have to, since although foreign officials can't be legally bound to investigations according to Crossbell law, that only holds if an official's identity is confirmed. Before they can get an answer from him, he turns toward the far-off buildings, claiming to have spotted Yin leaping from roof to roof. They fall for the distraction again, allowing Lecter to get away. He had a rope secured to the rooftop in advance to aid in his escape, much in the same fashion as his antics at Genis Royal Academy all those years ago. The citizens of Crossbell eventually point them to the casino. They finally corner him where he's seated at the slot machines. Of course, he won't give them an answer straight away, so he allows them to ask any question they like, and he will respond with a yes or no. Lloyd gets right down to business, asking if he's the Imperial government's second secretary, who is also associated with the Imperial Intelligence Division. Lecter confirms both roles. The questioning is then handed over to Ellie. Lecter's here for work, yet at the same time is not. Finally, he won't be here long and will be returning to the Empire in a week. With all of this confirmed, they're unable to ask any more questions. The redhead has the heart to ask if Kia is doing alright. Plus, he shows his gratitude for their successful arrest of the former Chairman Hartman. Part of the reason he came was to confirm that news. A young girl's voice then chimes in. She asks Lecter about the special tickets to the Arc-en-Ciel that he promised. She finally notices the other four and harasses Lloyd first. She gets really up close and personal, resulting in a very flustered detective. She sets her eyes on Ellie next and in a split second is found behind her, groping her more than ample assets. Noelle is shocked while Wazi just enjoys the view. Ellie collapses to the ground after finally being released from the young girl's grasp. The two then take their leave. Everyone tries to comfort the embarrassed Ellie after the very public display of very blatant sexual harassment. Wazi sure knows how to push her buttons though, since he assumes that she's used to it due to her skinship with Maria Bell. Ellie shouts that it's never gone that far as the scene cuts to the CSPD building. They are reporting back to Detective Emma, who's impressed with their findings. As for that young girl, she didn't appear to be an intelligence officer, but she was also much too nimble to be an ordinary civilian. They'll keep an eye on her for now. With most of the requests done, the four start their trek towards the police academy. They decide to go on foot since there's one more monster extermination they need to take care of along the way. Wazy is the only one who raises a fuss at first about walking, but Noel makes sure that a healthy youngster like him gets his exercise. About halfway along their trek, they spot a large man observing the railway lines running between Erebonia and Crossbell. Lloyd tries to engage in some pleasantries, but the man only tells him that the train is coming and to observe it carefully. Once it passes, he asks Lloyd how many passengers were present on it. The correct answer is 52. If given this correct answer, the man compliments Lloyd's eyesight. He tells him to keep training his eyes, so that he can instantly observe and grasp any situation. The man finally turns, revealing his single eye, and says that this is how one survives on the battlefield. With that, he departs towards the city. 
Upon leaving, Noel comments on the man's intimidating stature and how he presented no openings. What's even more surprising is the scene that Wazy notices further ahead. The large monsters the SSS were sent to exterminate are found utterly annihilated on the side of the road. It appears that all five of them were wiped out by large slash attacks. Even if the remains belong to monsters, the scene is still quite gruesome, so they quickly proceed onwards away from the carnage. They reach the area where the road to the police academy begins and find the gate already open for them. Because the man from earlier may pose a real threat to Crossbell City, Lloyd gives Section 1 a heads up just in case. The four then turn to the lush woodland ahead. We get some great party dynamics courtesy of our two new members again, then the four press onwards. Ellie notices a special area along the way that turns out to be the survival training grounds. The area located below is a harsher woodland with limited visibility and more wildlife. The training entails surviving the several days there with limited food, water and other provisions. Both Ellie and Wazy say they definitely pass on this half training, though the latter may potentially reconsider if some wine and hors d'oeuvres were included. Lloyd recalls that they do get dehydrated cheese rations since he did have to complete the training to pass his own detective exam. Noel wonders if Randy could be down there right now since the CGF makes use of these training areas. As of now, Randy is helping rehabilitate the CGF troops who were possessed by the Gnosis back in Zero. The four of them continue onwards and finally reach the police academy. Conveniently, Chief Sergei is already in the main lobby with the manager. Manager Juan leaves the meeting room to them so they can begin going over the basic fundamentals and driving and traffic safety. Yes, that's right. After going without for so long, the special support section is finally getting its own orbital vehicle. The traffic rules may seem basic now, but heavier regulations and stricter laws are expected to pass as ownership of private orbital cars grow. As for now, Chief Sergei leaves the driving to Noel since she's already had so much experience with the CGF vehicles. The Chief leaves to prepare the vehicle, leaving the four to speculate which manufacturer has built their orbital car. As of now, only the Verne Corporation in Calvert and the Rhineford Group in Erebonia develop vehicles for private use. The Verne Corporation specializes in compact and medium-sized assets, whereas the Rhineford Group specializes in trucks and limousines. No matter the manufacturer, however, the excitement is strong. Outside, a beautiful silver vehicle lies in wait. Noel, being the expert on cars, notices how the design fails to align with the models from either the Verne or Rhineford groups. And that's because the engineers over at Zay's central factory were the ones responsible. These XD78 models are the first orbital cars coming out of Laburl, since they previously relied mostly on air travel due to the country's steep geography. Noel can't help but bring out her inner fangirl and asks for the specs right away. Its max speed at 1500 Selg is even faster than travelling by the railway system. It turns out that the SSS wasn't initially going to receive such an amazing vehicle, but Mayor Croy has ordered this for them as a gift. The Chief hands over the keys as Lloyd and Ellie take a moment to truly savour this feeling, since they've been envying Section 1's private vehicles for so long. The scene cuts to the group cruising along towards the city, and Randy returns from survival training right as the car passes by along the highway. An exhausted warrant officer Muriel is amazed that Randy has so much energy even after their five-day survival excursion. Regarding the car, she wonders if it's a new model by the Verne Corporation, but Randy apparently caught on that it's said CF made. He's really looking forward to returning to the SSS, by which Muriel wonders how he could possibly know these things, but he responds that he saw Ellie, Lloyd and the Chief, and the two new recruits in the car. Plus, his eyes caught the ZCF emblem engraved on the body. Muriel asks him if he's really okay with not returning to the CGF, especially since, no matter how she sees it, his abilities are more suited towards military work. In response, he gives her a head pat, and says he'll come running whenever she's in trouble. A flustered Muriel jumps back and turns back towards the cliff, ordering her men to hurry it up. It looks like the construction was all cleared up just in time for the new warble car. It comes to light that Police HQ funded these additions, further highlighting the trust they now hold in the SSS. Ryu and Henry rush over to check out the cop's new goodies, then relay the message that Kia stayed behind with Sister Marble. Taking notice of Lloyd and Ellie's worry, the chief tells them to go pick her up directly. Right after the car takes off, Rias is seen exiting the bakery, pastries in tow, while Zeit is mysteriously watching from the rooftop of the SSS building. The four exit the car and are about to head up to the cathedral, but not before Wazy comments that he never thought he'd step into a church. Noel agrees that he doesn't look like a religious person at all. Apparently, he believes churches to be too creepy, but the others comment on how oddly religiously inspired his delinquent group was. He claims that the theming was due to Abbas's influence, when they're suddenly interrupted by a woman's voice. Rias asks if the cathedral is on this route, then Ellie and Rias finally recognise each other. Apparently, Rias looked after Ellie while she was studying abroad in the holy nation of Arteria, the high seat of the Septium Church. 
Sister Rias introduces herself and informs them that she's just been transferred to the Crossbell Cathedral. As a whispered aside to Ellie, she asks that she keep her actual status in the church a secret. She'll tell her the reasons for her assignment here in time. With that, she bids them all farewell. Lloyd notices that Wazy has been observing Rias for a while now, and his response is that she just seems to have an interesting presence. The air she gives off isn't that of any regular person. He turns to Ellie, since she must clearly know something. Fortunately for Ellie though, everyone lets it slide. At the cathedral, Lloyd finds it odd that classes are still being held. Kia has just successfully completed a difficult arithmetic problem to the shock of the older students. What's more, she reached this conclusion through an unconventional method as well. It looks like Kia has been hiding the fact that she's been taking extra classes from everyone else. Because of the young girl's interest, Sister Marble has allowed her to pursue natural sciences and math at a higher level. Kia begins to apologise for everything, but Lloyd and Ellie are happy to hear that she's finding more stimulating academic opportunity. Kia notices the sleek car right away and wonders who it belongs to. When she hears that it belongs to the SSS, she wonders how in the world they got it. Did they win the lottery or profit off of stocks? Lloyd's shocked that she even knows about these things, but it's nothing to get worked up over. Since Kia is so excited to ride in it, they decide to take the long scenic route home. The chief is speaking to someone on the phone when they finally return. He tells them to boot up the terminal and once it's done, they're all treated to a wonderful surprise. Tio was able to find some time to a video call from where she's staying at the Epstein Foundation. Some newly installed wireless boosters between Le Mans State and Crossbell City has made this communication possible. Kia asks Tio when she'll be back. It looks like it won't be until the end of the month at the very earliest. She thoughtfully wished to include Jonah in this call as well, but he unfortunately fell asleep after pulling one of his typical all-nighters. An alert on Tio's end means they have to end the call earlier than they'd like to, and so they tell her to call again soon, after which they say their goodbyes. The chief now wonders what they're all going to do regarding dinner, which managed to slip everyone's mind. They haven't come up with the meal preparation shifts yet among the present members, and upon learning that they take turns, Wazy comments that it really does sound like a chore. Lloyd offers to help teach him, but it's not like Wazy can't cook. It's just that he prefers not to and always had Abbas do it instead. Noel and Ellie suggest they make something easy to prepare together as an entire group for dinner. Then the scene fades out. The next day brings with it some peaceful rainfall. The plan is to collect any possible intelligence they can on that intimidating man, especially from Ashley at the pawn shop in downtown. They have some urgent requests from various Crossbell citizens to take care of first though. Of the most important ones, the first involves an investigation into people who have recently submitted a change of residence form. Some of the submitted names sound suspicious, especially since one belongs to a famous fairy tale author who has already passed away. Hmm. First on the list is the home that previously belonged to Mr. Bond, a victim of the Gnosis incident. No one answers the door at first, but they hear voices inside and the door isn't locked. It turns out to be the three rowdy foreigners from the day before. The name Highbloods, which they submitted on the form, refers to how all three of them are the wealthy sons of some Verncorp higher-ups. Unsurprisingly, they all demonstrate beyond snobby and distasteful attitudes. The SSS is then rudely shooed out when the hostesses they called for arrive. The four lament how Mr. Bond's beautiful home fell into the hands of such stuck-up brats, so they head off to his new residence on East Street to hear his side of the story. Mr. Bond remembers them all as the cops who saved him and the other victims from their underground imprisonment during the Gnosis scandal. Unfortunately for his family though, they had to sell the house in order to pay off the massive debt Mr. Bond accumulated from investing in those blue pills. Mr. Bond recognizes that this is a consequence of his own actions. Despite everything though, he counts his blessings. As all the debt has been repaid, he still has his old job, and his wife and daughter haven't abandoned him despite his mistakes. The strong bond the family shares is touching to witness, along with Mr. Bond's resolve to make the most of this fresh start. Not to mention little Sunita's positivity regarding her family's situation. Next up is the building that is no longer the fishing guild as they once knew it. 
They enter right as an argument is taking place between the old members of the club and some very lavishly dressed new faces. The man introduces himself as Lake Lord III, the heir to the Lake Lord Corporation based out of Erebonia, which just happens to be the premier fishing gear manufacturer in the entire continent. He has recently acquired this building in order to expand his Fishing Emperor Club to other regions in Zemuria. He has all the necessary documents to prove the legality of this new lease contract, and his elitism shines through since he believes that the building is wasted on the likes of these amateurs. All the members of the old fishing club gather at the jazz bar on Back Street afterwards to update Lloyd on what's been going on. First of all, the club has been suspended for the past couple months by a restraining order due to the fact that Joachim Gunter was one of its members. They were contacted about a week ago by the real estate company, which brought the news that their lease contract has been terminated due to their inactive use of the building. This allowed the Lake Lord Corporation to take over. Unfortunately, there's nothing that can be done now but to find a new location that can serve as the fishing guild's office. Last up is an apartment in downtown. The new resident initially tries to play it off like he's not home, but they hear a loud noise from inside. When they're finally able to enter, they're immediately greeted by Congressman Geval's accusations. He believes that they've only come to make fun of him and his new lot in life after losing everything he once had. Though he's getting his just desserts now, he is still in pretty good shape when compared to the other congressmen who were tied directly to the cult incident. The four display some empathy and advise him that it's best to just submit his legal name for any further documents. On the way out, Lloyd hopes that Congressman Geval and the other politicians will choose an honest path in the future. Ellie internally wishes the same for Ernest as well. Thus concludes their investigation on behalf of City Hall, but before they report back, they stop by the pawn shop to consult with Ashley, a former weapons dealer. She seems to know who that man must be, since few would match his description. It's quite dire news if he really has come to Crossbell. In honor of her late source, Guy Bannings, she confirms that the one-eyed man is not a terrorist. He is incredibly dangerous, though. The rest they will have to figure out for themselves. Right as they're leaving downtown, Wald calls Wazi out. Wazi asks him how he's been since the Saber Vipers haven't seen their leader around lately. The big guy just tells him to shut it, especially since he's just some dog of the police now. He wonders what exactly Wazi is planning, but his most egregious mistake is daring to step away without settling their rivalry. The normally composed Wazi remains silent as Lloyd attempts to calm Wald down, but the delinquent just draws his weapon and says there's no way he'll let the leader of the testament just leave. Wazi finally lays out some harsh reality for Wald. Doesn't he realize that they can't be delinquents forever? The truth is, is that Wazi formed the testaments to keep the Saber Vipers in check. All the members of his gang grew stronger over this long period to the point where they can now stand on their own without Wazi. And finally, someday they will outgrow the gang and go on to find their real life's calling. He believes the Saber Vipers, including Wald, have it in them to move forward as well. They had the heart to resist the Mafia, so now they'll eventually find their own respectable paths. Wald just laughs in his face for spouting such nonsense, then assumes an attack stance. Wazi tells Lloyd to stay out of it, since he needs to take care of this himself. Wald looks forward to thoroughly beating Wazi so the latter will snap out of it, but the former gang leader isn't messing around today. A golden aura surrounds him, and what proceeds is one of the most thorough curb stomp beatdowns in the entire series. Wazi thoroughly pummels the Saber Vipers leader before Wald can even get a single hit in.
Wald is outraged that Wazi has just been holding back this entire time, even though the latter admits this technique wasn't something he should be using. He informs Wald that he went all out today, and that this is his last show of good faith to him. He bids farewell to the Saber Vipers leader, but not before admitting that the last two years have been a lot of fun. Lloyd, Noel, and Ellie silently follow Wazi as he departs from downtown, leaving Wald and his broken pride all alone in the square. Wazi finally pauses before they reach East Street and apologizes for showing this unsightly side to the other three, but Lloyd understands and says that's just what men do sometimes. Ellie can't claim to understand, but she could tell that Wazi faced Wald with no actual bad feelings, and Noelle believes that the Saber Vipers leader will understand what Wazi was trying to say someday. Now in a better mood, Wazi says they have some more requests to finish up. They report back to City Hall and finally notice the funny coincidence of how Republicans have moved onto West Street while Imperials have moved to East Street. The next request entails a fun expansion to the Orbal Net. Chief Roberts, a representative of the Epstein Foundation and T.O. Superior, needs help with the final test for the new video game, Palm. The number of personally owned terminals has been increasing across the city, so now would be a good time to release Palm to the public. He gives them a beta file of the game in the form of a memory quartz. Everyone appears rather lost, especially since Tio isn't here to install everything, but Ellie remembers watching her do this kind of stuff before. Chief Roberts gives them his Palm account, then awaits their call once they finish setting up the quartz at the SSS terminal. Lloyd is challenged to a game as soon as the quartz is installed, and the beta version works perfectly, showing no lag or transmission problems. Thanks to their help, Chief Roberts can perfect an official version that'll be released to the public soon. He encourages them to play against many different people throughout Crossbell once it's out. Lloyd receives a call from Fran shortly after. The mayor of Mines Village has asked the SSS to investigate some strange happenings in one of the old mines. Though monsters commonly appear in these abandoned areas, something just doesn't seem right this time, so the villagers would like the four to check it out. However, first up is a quick visit to the library, since an optional, but incredibly important, game-spanning questline with Mr. Nielsen opens up. He lost his sight in an accident many years ago, but that hasn't stopped him from pursuing his investigative journalism. The four agree to an interview with him regarding the cult incidents. Mr. Nielsen demonstrates his incredible knack for investigations, as he already knows a great deal about the case. In fact, his knowledge even helps the SSS put two and two together, such as how the leader of the DG cult operation, Cassius Bright, is Estelle's father. However, Mr. Nielsen eventually steers the interview towards the DG cult's origins. Lloyd tells him what they heard from Joachim himself, that the inspiration came from the alchemists who arrived 500 years ago. The journalist skillfully connects the points and assumes that the young girl that is currently in their care must be from that ancient era too. Taking in their reaction, Nielsen apologizes for his lack of tact, then thanks them for the information. He has learned a lot and hopes to exchange info with them again sometime. Right after he departs for his next interview, Ellie finally remembers where she heard his name before. Marcel Nielsen is a former Grosbell news reporter who won the Fulitzer Prize 10 years ago. The war coverage that won him this international award is also responsible for his lost sight. Even so, he has continued to travel the continent to deliver his excellent reports. He's basically a legend among journalists. Lloyd says he'd like to speak with him again in the future, then they begin their trek to Mines Village. A visit to the Rosenberg doll studio shows Meister Jorg speaking with Campanella and Professor Novartis, though of course the SSS are still in the dark about the latter two's identities. 
The professor asked for the new data on Potter Motter, and the entire conversation showcases how the Meister and professor just don't get along. But the professor especially pushes Meister Jorg's buttons when he says he doesn't want Enforcer 15's potential to go to waste. Right at that moment, the four SSS members finally approach. The Meister tells Campanella to take the professor and leave, so the two do just that. The four apologize for interrupting the Meister's visit with his guests, but he doesn't mind. He abruptly states that he has nothing to say to them now, though if they have important business later on, he'll at least listen in deference for Ren. Now that they're alone, Lloyd voices his worry about those other two guests, though Noelle thinks they didn't appear particularly dangerous, but Wazi thinks otherwise to himself. They arrive at the mayor's home and are reunited with Mr. Gantz. He's back to mining and has reverted to his typical friendly and down-to-earth self. He's very grateful to the SSS for helping him back then. But to the business at hand, the sealed entrance of one of the old abandoned mines was completely broken through recently. It had to have been something or someone incredibly strong to have done this. But the strangest phenomena to arise is the change to the tunnel. It appears to be faintly glowing with a purple-red light now. Miner Gantz goes on ahead to clear the temporary blockade around the mine. The SSS arrive shortly after and observe the remains of a large sturdy gate. Miner Gantz wishes them all safety as the four step into the ominous tunnel. The interior is definitely not normal, as it's now entrenched in a strange purple glow. Wazi believes the higher elements are likely present here, an observation that draws everyone's complete shock. How is Wazi able to sense things that only Tio has picked up on before? He reassures them that his past is not like hers, but he does have a knack for sensing the supernatural. A sizzling sound suddenly draws their attention, and Noelle screams at everyone to get back. A massive explosion brings down the entire entrance to the mine, and a worried Mr. Gantz is unable to reach them, so he frantically rushes off to get help. Thanks to Noelle's experience with firearms and explosives, she was able to recognize the danger and usher everyone to safety just in time. Lloyd and Noelle suspect that this was set up by someone to trap them inside this mine. Most likely, they were watching from a distance and set off the explosion remotely. Since there's nothing else they can do, though, they press forward in the hopes of finding a different exit. Finally, the burst option in battle is unlocked, and it reappears at various high points throughout the rest of the game. A little farther in, the glowing purple is revealed to stem from some interesting plants. Ellie remembers coming across something called glittering moss, or Zemurian moss, that is used in medicine, though its color is different from this purple glow. Surprisingly, Wazi confirms her theory. Zemurian moss usually emits a golden hue, but the color can vary due to the influence of septium. This particular mushroom species is called firefly fungus and usually emits a green glow. It normally doesn't reach such a size though, so it looks like there's some disturbance in the septium veins. Noelle's curious as to where Wazi got all this knowledge, but then regrets asking when he responds that one of his customers teaches him all sorts of things. The four finally reach a large expanse in the depths of the mine. It looks like there's no exit here, either. Just what did the party that caused the explosion hope to accomplish? Ellie wonders if the people at the doll studio are responsible, but Lloyd thinks otherwise. The detective is distracted from his thoughts when he notices some glowing blue flowers up on the cliffs. But suddenly, Wazi warns them all to look out. A massive winged monster descends and emits some kind of vibration that saps the four of their energy. It's really not looking good for them, but a familiar howl pierces through the cave. Randy, of all people, dashes forward and gets rid of the monster's dangerous technique. Then Zeit shows up shortly after. Thus begins a difficult battle. 
After taking enough damage, the beast strangely dissipates into nothing. As for Randy's unexpected arrival, he had just returned to the SSS building this afternoon after completing the CGF rehabilitation training. He got news that they headed to mines, so he fortunately caught up just in time to save them. It's all thanks to the miners as well, since they were able to clear all the rubble that was blocking the entrance to the mine. Zeit showed up to guide Randy to the floor's exact location. Gantz and the other miners catch up and are relieved to see they are all okay. They can't believe that the mine's interior has transformed into this, though. The entire group returns to the village, where CGF reinforcements are called in to investigate the area for any suspicious clues. Four of the SSS members climb into the car, as Randy takes a moment to get another good look at their stylish new vehicle. Randy thinks he'll be a real lady killer with this new ride, but Wazzy says he's still got a ways to go if he's relying on an assistant. Noelle can't help but agree, drawing out the playful teasing. The good thing is that Randy learned how to drive thanks to his recent CGF training, so they have a spare driver just in case. The convo becomes serious again as they discuss the explosives used at the mine. Just where did these people get the materials for it? Since explosives based on gunpowder are rarely used nowadays now that technology has advanced. Randy shoots down all their theories though, saying that the explosive used at the mine is a new high performance model that was released only a couple years ago. Even though most militaries have abandoned gunpowder based weapons, other groups still make use of them, especially Jaegers. Plus, Erebonia is still the biggest user of these kinds of weaponry. This news prompts Ellie to relay their findings on Imperial Secretary Lecter from yesterday. The incident with the young redhead girl is also brought up and Randy grows silent. As the other four recall the large man as well, they finally realize that Randy has the same shade of red hair as both of them. This leads to the elephant in the room. The redhead becomes incredibly serious and ominously mutters that they've finally come. Then Lloyd receives a call from Detective Dudley. He informs him that the Rivace building just sold to an organization called Crimson & Co. It appears that they made a quick deal and snatched the building right from under the Heiyue's noses. This Crimson & Co. apparently has some shady dealings in the Imperial capital and runs a high-class club called Noya Blanc. A branch of this club opened up in Crossbell just a year ago, and now it's really looking to expand. Dudley says they should ask Randy about Crimson & Co. Then he hangs up. Randy's already put two and two together. He asks Noelle to stop by the backstreet entrance in the entertainment district on their way back. Crimson & Co. is just a front that's used to secure fundraising for the Red Constellation's Jaeger Corps operations. The car continues along as the two people from the doll studio observe from atop a bridge. The man in the white robe informs Campanella that their roles have been decided. Both of them, along with the Seventh Anguis, have been tasked with leading this mission. The professor also leaves what's called the Astral Code project in Campanella's hands. He wishes to see how it operates in a low network environment. They both show complete deference to the Grandmaster, stating that this is all for her sake. Then they part ways. The man in white activates some contraption and vanishes. Then Campanella announces to no one in particular that he'll be overseeing the Phantasmal Blaze plan as the Grandmaster's proxy. Once Noelle parks in the entertainment district, Randy immediately takes off on his own. He's reunited with his uncle and cousin Shirley after two years apart. Lecter's suspicions of Randy's familial ties to these other two redheads is finally substantiated. Thanks to anticipating the Heiyue branch manager's schemes, Lecter was able to secure the deal for Crimson & Co. first. Shirley is giddy with excitement as she'll now be able to finish up what their Jaeger Corps started last year against the Heiyue of Calvert's Eastern District. 
More serious than we've ever seen him before, Randy asks his uncle what the hell he's planning to do in Crossbell. The one-eyed man gives a dismissive response in order to make room for the actual big news. Randy's father, the leader of the Red Constellation, died in battle against Zephyr's boss about half a year ago. The two strongest Jaeger leaders simultaneously defeated each other in one decisive showdown. Randy recovers and claims he's not at all surprised that his old man would go out in such a fashion. Shirley recalls how her uncle looked like he was having such a blast during that final duel. She wishes that she had an opponent like that. Randy's uncle says he probably had no regrets. Well, aside from his irresponsible and unworthy son. The one-eyed man then turns his back and states that Randy's vacation is over now. They'll be in contact. Then he, Shirley, and Lecter disappear into their new purchase. Randy turns back to the party and confirms that his family members, Sigmund Orlando and Shirley Orlando, are correspondingly the vice commander and a commanding officer of the Red Constellation. He ominously refers to them as the worst of the ogres, as a flash of lightning pierces the sky. It looks like foreboding days lie ahead as chapter 1 is brought to a close. And this is where we're going to end part 1. Big thanks to the Kisaki Nut for helping me out with this one. Check out his channel for news and other great content on the Kisaki series and Nihon Falcom in general. So, I found the ambient rain and accompanying OST super relaxing, despite everything going on in this chapter. One of my favorite rainy day mood setters, that's for sure. Apart from Persona 5's instrumental Beneath the Mask, of course. Next time we'll be covering the West Zemuria Trade Conference in all its glory. So until next time, take care. See ya!